Chorsey Eisen for like <laughs> that. And a new Irish record for Phil Healy, 22.99. Christy Cooney hands over the Sam Maguire Cup to Graham Canty, Cork All-Ireland Champions for the seventh time ever. Hello and welcome to the Star Sport Podcast. My name is Jack McCarran of the Southern Star and I'm joined as always by Star Sport Editor Kieran McCarthy. On this week's show we're chatting to Shane McCormack, coach of Ireland's fastest woman and one of West Cork's Olympic hopefuls, Phil Healy. We'll also hear from Mark O'Donovan, the bentry man behind an app that aims to make it easier for GA clubs to organise their fixtures across all ages and all codes. But before all that, Kieran, you were at Parky Cueve on Saturday evening to see both the Cork men's and ladies' teams in action in the opening round of the league. Orla Finn from Kinsale was once again to stand out as Efi Fitzgerald's charges beat Westmead 1 9 to 6 points to get their campaign off to a flyer, while Rona McCarthy's side kick off their life in Division 3 with a 20 points to 13 win over Offaly. Convincing enough from both sides, Kieran. But what I want from you today is your five biggest takeaways from the opening night of league action at Parky Cueve in the year 2020. Okay, Jack, starting with the, the ladies' performance. Um, what stood out was Evie Fitzgerald is trying to build a stronger squad this year as opposed to combat Dublin when you get to the later rounds of the championship. Um, so he's looking for strength and depth during the league and we saw that already on Saturday night Roisin Phelan is back after being absent last year she's a big addition Peter Sullivan is back Kira McCarthy is back Quifa O'Callaghan from Kinsale made her debut missing the last night were Neve Cotter Darren O'Sullivan uh, Kira O'Sullivan Emer Meany yet Cork still won and they got points on the board in their first game of the league so that's that's a big plus second takeaway is it was a winning start for, for the Cork ladies footballers they lost their opener last year in the National League there's a change to the Division 1 structure this year where only the top two teams go through to the, to the, to the Division 1 final before it was um, the top four go through the semi-finals so points on the board early are very very important so Cork got off the winning start two points on the board and it sets them up well for their game against Tipperary this weekend turning to the footballers um, which was the second game in Parky Cueve what stood out was Michael Hurley's performance. Um, the Castlehaven men came off the bench at half time and he kicked five points in the second half for Cork. Um, as impact subs go, he made a huge impact. He caused awfully an awful lot of trouble. Um, he's pushing now for a starting spot. Uh, he did well against Tipperary in the McGrath Cup, so Cork are away to Leitrim this weekend. So it's a selection headache for the Cork management team, but a welcome one. Also, what was important last Saturday night was that the Cork men's footballers won a game at Parky Cueve first. It was their first win at the new redeveloped Parky Cueve in six attempts. They'd lost their previous five games there, but also um, was very important. It was a home win for Cork under Rona McCarthy in the last two years. They've only won one out of their seven homely games between Parky Cueve and Parky Ring. And like I said after, that's an appalling record. Um, if Cork wanted to get out of Division 3 and their four home games, their home form is so important, so really important to get that first win and points on the board. And my final takeaway was the Parky Creek pitch. We've heard so much about this pitch last year, especially there was a lot of negative press about it. It cut up so badly. Um, a lot of remedial work and well, a new pitch is down there and the pitch looked fantastic on Saturday night. Held up superbly well for the for the two games. A lot of praise for the after from Rona McCarthy, from Ify Fitzgerald, from the Offaly manager. So um, thumbs up to the Cork County board. The pitch looks great and hopefully it's going to hold up. Well, there you have it, Kieran's Five big takeaways from Parky Cueve on Saturday evening. And before we, we leave the football there, Kieran, I suppose just to go a little bit more in depth on both of the games. It was obviously historic for a number of reasons for the ladies, although you debunked maybe that was the first time the ladies had ever played in Parky Cueve. But it's still a historic occasion mm-hmm. nonetheless. So what did you think of their performance and how were they received by the Parky Cueve faithful? Oh, it's great to see the Cork senior ladies play in Parky Cueve. It's a kind of a stage and a platform they really deserve to kind of to, to play on. And they did quite well. Um, they, they admitted after that they were nervous. And, and, and you can understand why, because there was a lot of talk in the pre-match build-up, a lot of hype about this game being in Parky Cueve. So nervous did play a part. It wasn't the most fluent and fluid performance we'd see from this Cork ladies team this year. But you've got to take into account too, Jack, I suppose it is the first game of the league. You know, it is their first competitive game. 
and um, they're only kind of together the last three weeks so they'll get better as the, as the league goes on so an encouraging start um, they were never really in trouble um, they were they were well up uh, I think they were five or six points up at half time never really in trouble kind of always in control um, Westmead kind of sat very deep so it was a very defensive style that Cork uh, came up against but they'd have to get used to that if you Fitzgerald said after they need to be a bit more patient but as first games in the league go they won box ticked and move on to the next game this weekend good stuff and then obviously with the men it was their first outing in Division 3 so an unusual place for a lot of those players to find themselves but how were they received then by the Parky Cree faithful because it's unusual for Cork fans of any code to be going out supporting their team in Division 3 so what was the attendance like what was the atmosphere like and what was the chatter on the terraces were people happy to see them winning or were people like genuinely were, were fans almost embarrassed to be watching the Cork senior footballers in Division 3 action and just because I didn't get to go so I'm intrigued to, to, to know what the feeling was first off it's important to note that the crowd was small it was I think 2,300 around that was the official attendance so that gets lost in Parky Cueve where the press box is I understand we looked over you could see no one on the terraces and no one on the opposite stand you could hear the noise coming from below like it was a very very small crowd um, but this is where the Cork footballers are at now they're down in Division 3 they have to get out of it they were nine points to eight down at half time, and at one stage in the first half, they were seven seven three down. After they reeled off six points in a row, and you're thinking, "Oh Jesus, don't kind of, please don't do this." You know, kind of. It did look they were again rusty in the first half. They rushed, they rushed some of their passes, some poor decision making. Um, but the second half was a lot better. Like we mentioned earlier, Michael Hurley came off the bench, kicked five points. The Cork bench really did make an impact. They got nine points off the bench in the second half. Um, and Cork were, were very much in control in the second half. They ran out seven-point winners. Um, Ian Maguire had a goal chance in each half. And to borrow Ronan McCarthy's words after, he butchered both. So it could have been a more convincing win for the Cork footballers. Um, it's it, They have to get out of Division 3, Jack. You know, kind of, there's no two ways about it. They're away to lead from this Sunday um, and on paper you think like Cork against Leitrim that should be a Cork win but just think back to last weekend where Leitrim drew away to Derry in, in, in Celtic Park and Derry needed late points to kind of salvage a draw there so Ronan McCarthy was at pains to stress afterwards that there there were no gimmies in in, um, in Division 3 but still if Cork have serious ambitions of competing in the Tier 1 Championship they'll have to win promotion they'll have to go in, away and beat a team like Leitrim um, because they just they just have to if they want to get out kind of Ron McCarthy is kind of saying that they need 10 points he's targeting 10 points to get promotion from Division 3 so you're looking at 5 wins 4 of those games are at home so they need to win on the road as well but I just look back at the Division 3 table 2 years ago and whoever came out of that did both teams at 11 points so Cork might need more than the 5 wins so um, home form is crucial but they need to pick up points on the road too so couple of plus points there um, again first performance I wouldn't read too much into just yet because there was four under 20s starting as well um, so we'll see how they go this weekend against Leitrim but um, it'll be great to see them build up a bit of momentum get a couple of wins on the board and then I think it's down the week after in Parky Cueve again so looking forward to that one yeah now I just I'm going to put you on the spot for a second so if you don't know the answer to this question we'll just brush over it but you mentioned the the low attendance that was there on Saturday so just just over 2000 and this obviously was a division 3 game would you have any idea what sort of attendance they got for their division 2 games last year was it much down or was it pretty much the same and should the court footballers be playing these games at Parky Rim I think it's pretty much the same for the league games for the Cork footballers and um, I know what you mean about Parky Cueve against Parky Ring kind of but I think Parky Cueve is the main stadium it's they the home to, stadium they've paid for it now they've paid for it now and even if you think the fact that like the county board have so, kind of sold their, their kind of was it their premium tickets or their season tickets and so on so that's on the basis that those games are in Parky Cueve so for those people who have those tickets you know it's only fair to have it in Parky Cueve I don't know how cost effective it is to be quite honest you know you're opening up this huge big stadium for for these small crowds but it's actually important I think for the Cork footballers to play in Parky Cueve Ron McCarthy actually said it after he goes it's starting to feel like home now um, and especially if you think further down the line in May that there is a Munster Championship semi-final against Kerry and Parky Cueve I think it's important that the Cork footballers 
get used to the stadium that they train there on the week of games that they play there that well, they I see a headline in this week Southern Star out in the hallway there Ronan McCarthy saying that they need to make Porky Cueve a fortress mm-hmm. essentially so that plays into it especially with the Kerry game as you that's mentioned that's exactly and th- th- like we said the four home games like hopefully they'll win those four home games and all of a sudden kind of there's a positive kind of feeling around Cork and uh, um, Cork the Cork football is a Porky Cueve because like I said they'd lost their previous five games there so it was, it was important to beat Offaly to put that little to put that bad record to bed they need to kick on now and make Porky Cueve a fortress and, and make it feel like home because it's still a very new stadium and they haven't played there maybe is that their fourth time I think fourth or fifth time so they haven't played there too much in the last couple of years so I think it's important that it, it feels like home so um, good start ok well we leave the football there for now and we're going to take a quick break but coming up next we're joined by Phil Healy's coach Shane McCormack Thanks for listening to the Star Sport Podcast the only podcast dedicated to all things sport in West Cork Don't forget to pick up this Thursday Southern Star newspaper, including our award-winning sports section with everything a West Cork sports fan could want. In shops across West Cork and online from anywhere in the world via www.southernstar.ie forward slash e-paper. The Southern Star and the Star Sport Podcast, number one for sport in West Cork. The Balanin bullet, Phil Healy was in action in Athlone at the weekend, opening her indoor season with an impressive win. Kieran, I see you tweeting about her this morning, so before we hear from her coach, Shane, you might fill us in on where Phil is at going into 2020. Uh, 2020 is a big year for Phil Healy, potentially the biggest of her career yet. Uh, she's our sights set on qualifying for the Tokyo Olympics later this summer, and that'll be absolutely remarkable for this, this West Cork lady who is Ireland's fastest ever woman. She holds the 100 meter and 200 meter Irish national, national records. She kicked off her indoor season last weekend with a super win in that loan. Uh, winning in the 200 metres and the time which is I'm not going to say no because I'm going to get it wrong but it was off point one one of a second off the Irish national record and the third fastest Irish indoor women's 200 metre um, of all time in Ireland so it's a really encouraging start to Phil's season um, we have an interview coming up with Shane McCormick our coach he's going to fill us in on how Phil can book her tickets on that plane to Tokyo um, it's going to be a really exciting year for Phil Healy and like always we're going to follow her very very closely so you can catch up now with what her coach Shane McCormick had to say. Phil kicked off her season with a very impressive 23-28 uh, in that loan over the weekend Shane that's an encouraging start to the season. Yeah it's brilliant brilliant opener um, so we, we yeah we, we kind of knew halfway through the through the winter that, that the, the form was back after her injury that she sustained early in the, in the summer last year and you know, she she got back to very good form, but not her best form um, that she showed early with her 23, 23 or four opener in in in, uh, in April. So um, it was a, it was a tough summer. She ran exceptionally well. It was 23 three considering she broke a foot. Doha was probably a bridge too far, world champs fitness wise and mentally wise. But once she took a break, <coughs> um, a lot of the hard work we had put in during the summer started to shine through in in October November. So we knew we were in a very good place, um, based on. You know, times she was running training and and things that were happening in the gym with her with her strength. So, um, you know, the form was there, but until you actually race, you, you don't know uh, for certain. But yeah, she took care of business yesterday. How encouraging is it that Phil has r- ran such a quick time so early in the season? Is it a very good indicator for what might come in the coming weeks and months? Yeah, hundred percent. Because you know, obviously, we did we didn't take the load off too much coming into this race because there's, there's bigger races ahead. Um, like we're heading to Vienna for for a race on Saturday where she she'll flip it around and she'll run the four and, and potentially a two hundred to finish, and then um, we we have a big race in the Athlone uh, AIT Grand Prix, um, with with, with a, a, an international field and it's been organised around a two hundred indoor, and then obviously on to national senior. So there, there's bigger races ahead, and we know Phil ups her game, and um, so touch woods that those races will bring faster times out of her. Obviously, 2020 is a big year, Shane. It's an Olympic year, and Phil wants to secure her ticket on that plane to Tokyo later in the summer. What's the process for Phil to try and qualify for the Olympic Games? So, there's, there's two there's two ways into the Olympics. Okay, there's two ways to Tokyo. You run you run the qualifying time, or you have a very good ranking position, which is basically be in the top 56 in the world. Currently, Phil is lying 40th. Her time yesterday would move definitely move her up. 
uh, couple of spots because indoor times are, are weighted a little bit better than outdoor times. Uh, so it's, it's, it's in her favour to run as fast as she can, and she will indoor. Um, 22.80 is the standard. Um, so, you know, she opened up last year with 23.04. Her national record is 22.99. She's ran 23.2 already in there. So you can see that she's in. She's going to be close enough to that time. But the, 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 the safety net is the ranking. Um, like I said, she, she's 40th at the moment. I'd be hoping that she'd be closer to 30th um, by the time we hit June. That, that's the plan, and that's what we've been focused on since, since last summer. So, like, to put it in context, Phil, the way the ranking systems work, you've 12 months to run times. So Phil getting back after breaking her foot and actually getting to Napoli last year was, was extremely crucial um, just to get some base points on the board so that she wasn't coming to this year completely uh, devoid of, of any sort of ranking point. Now, the good thing is she keeps her points that she got in Berlin in 2018 mm-hmm. at the European Championships where she finished 11th overall. So she has a nice... She, she's a nice anchor points there coming into this year. Um, so so that's, her, that's her two paths to Tokyo, and, and either of those paths we'll take, you know. And that means so that there's probably more importance attached to kind of the races this year. Like you said, there's ranking points on offer for, for different races. So does that change your approach as a coach? Kind of um, like, are you going to try to get Phil hopefully to, to peak a couple of times this season first to kind of get the qualification times and then fingers crossed for Tokyo later in the summer? No, no. With Phil, with Phil, the way the way things work and the way we found works best is, you know, going up to the four hundred training always allows her is always conducive to her running fast over any distance. So we knew after Doha last September we just needed to get back into her bread and butter work, get her back fit, get her back being able to do rep, 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 and just get comfortable with the rhythm again. So. You know, Phil is, has done a 400 meter winter. She just opened up with a PB over 200. So it's 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 the it's the model that worked in like in 2018, um, and it's the model that we're we're basing you know uh, th- this year on again. So we never got too far away from speed anyway. Uh, but w- once Phil is fit, she, she can target any any distance and and you know getting her to be fit for July, uh, touch wood once all is good, it won't be an issue. It's the 200 metres that Phil wants to qualify in for Tokyo. But um, can you explain to me the importance of Phil running at 400 metres too? Kind of, Why do you flip between the two? Um, it, it, it's just, to be honest with you, I think uh, it's it, not just female athletes, it's probably any athlete, and, and maybe not for all models, but I always find you nearly need to run above the distance well to be good at the distance that you want to be. So if you want to be a good 100 metre runner, you need to be a good 200 meter runner. If you want to be a good 200 meter runner, you need to be a, at least a half decent uh, 400 meter runner. Um, and just with Phil, it opens up more opportunities, especially for indoor running, because there isn't a 200 meter indoor at, at a, a championship event anymore. Um, and there's only a 60, so there's a big gap between a 60 and a four. And she's like a 200 meter probably specialist. And, you know she can use that in in a, in a 400. So it's it's got her to a world indoors. It's got her to two European indoors. And it's given her more experience. And it's all about, you know, it's all about experience. It's all about being at these majors and, you know, making mistakes, learning from mistakes, um, and hopefully it all come together at at some point. And all those lessons will will um, you know amalgamate into into you know a, a, a deep performance that ultimately that we seek. You know. You know Phil better than most, Shane, and, and she's the Irish 100 meter and 200 meter record holder. Are we looking at hopefully Phil breaking those records or coming close to them this year? And and you feel that she has that speed in her to go even faster? Oh, 100 percent, yeah, 100 percent. Like there's, there's, Phil has only gone 25, so she's nowhere near a peak. She's probably coming into her peak years at the moment. So you know, like yeah, last year was a setback. She was probably. You know, opening up with 23 or 4, I, I think she would have gone on to run, you know, a 22.8 or a 22.7 that summer. Um, you know, she got offered lanes in Diamond Leagues. Unfortunately, she broke her foot, so she couldn't she couldn't race those races. But um, the signs are there. All we can do is just look, take it week by week. We learned a very valuable lesson last year that you can't get you can't get ahead of yourself at all. Not that we were getting ahead of ourselves, but you you can't think past the next session. It forced me as a coach to be 
you know, more focused at like, let's make this session the best session that we ever do, or the next race the best race that we, we do, or, you know, it, it, it's more about the, the mini goals than the larger goals. Obviously, you need the larger goals to keep you on track, but with Phil, it's like, let's just, you know, it was tough year last year, let's enjoy this now. So I think the enjoyment is, is definitely helping, and the speed is there, and everything is there, so we just need to we just need to stick the course, and, and, and definitely the, 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 the times will come. Oh, great stuff, Shane. And while I have you, I also want to chat to you a small bit just about, I suppose, the benefits of athletics coaching in the GEA. We saw it last year when you were involved with the Tipperary Senior Hurling team that won the, um, the All-Ireland. And we might start to see more athletics coaches becoming involved with GEA teams. What's the big benefit? What can, what can a club player or an inter-county player kind of benefit from having an athletics coach involved, Shane? Yeah, it's, it's very simple, Karen. To be honest with you, like who who doesn't want to be the fastest on the field? You know, like GA is a field-based sport. It's no different than the NFL. The only difference is the NFL uh, and even Premier League soccer and things like that put a massive emphasis on speed. Um, and for some reason, it, it, it's never been a primary, secondary, or even a tertiary focus of of, of, of you know, with, you know, with exceptions. Obviously, you can see teams like Dublin and things like that and would would have a very athletic based focus. So um I, I I think it's it's you know, it's something that should be done more and more. I think um you know at at inter county level players are already very skillful. You're getting picked because you're skillful. You're gonna get natural athletes, people that are fast. But I you know, who doesn't want a faster panel? Like who doesn't want uh, you know, a, a team's average peak velocity being, you know, better for championships. So it's it, to me, it's 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 a it's a it's a no-brainer. It's a not a fad. Speed is not a fad. It's not like you know every couple of years, other things come up. Speed is the basis of all sport. Speed wins. Speed is king. Um, and it definitely, if you're an inter-county manager and you're not looking at speed, <laughs> you know you're not you're not looking for, um, you know you're not looking for the best. You know what I mean? You have to you have to you have to search all these avenues and. Like I said, look, the NFL based their game on speed. Their track athletes, they're, you know, obviously they have a bigger pool of, of talent to pick from. The only reason I picked the NFL is because it is probably the most speed-based field sport out there. And um, but definitely from a GA perspective, and it's low-hanging fruit as well. If you do it right, and again, it it it, it, could, it should be micro dose. It shouldn't be something that people jump at and you know you start hammering players. You can't do it that way. You have to be you have to be careful. You know, especially. You know, it, 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 it should be something that's looked more at developmental level. And you can see there's an awful lot. Counties are doing a lot more of this stuff. The fundamentals are coming back into it. So I definitely think you're going to see a, a focus shift more and more towards it, you know. The, the $64,000 question. So for, let's say, a club player listening to this podcast um, now, Shane, how can they improve their own kind of speed? How can they run faster? Any tips or advice you can give them to help them run that bit faster? Yeah, like a, like a lot of a lot of clubs will have coaches that may, maybe have the knowledge already, and they're, maybe they're already doing it. But like, look, like the GA was fundamentally the Gaelic Athletic Association back in the day before it split. So, like, you know, I think, you know, if you go back in history, clubs did cross country. Clubs did, you know, the ran to play basketball. There was a lot more crossover, and now we've got very specialised in the GA. It's, you know, like you, you see the great debate at the moment about the number of games, the length of seasons, the crossover between colleges and club and, and, and county and um, so it's 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 if you're a club GA player and you want to get better you need to seek out uh, somebody that knows what they're talking about you know that could be just going out to your local club there's there's hundreds of athletic clubs in Ireland you know that's not to say that there's the right level of coach available for somebody at a you know senior level but you know I think clubs could be reached could could try and identify you know coaches within athletics that have something to offer and um, um, and there are plenty of people out there um, that 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 have that 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 skill set and that knowledge. You know, like I said, it's low hanging fruit, um, and it would be remiss of anybody that's not following that avenue. You know. And when a player is trying to tap into their their potential when it comes to speed, is it literally how they run? Is it the mechanics of their run? Is it their starting or the feet are at the start? Like, how can you, like, how can athletics kind of help? The, the player even gained that extra one or two percent in terms of speed. Yeah, look, look, it, look it's multifaceted, and you can you can you can overcomplicate it as well, right? And the last thing you need to do with somebody who wants 
to just get faster to play hurling or football or camogie or whatever it may be is is to make it over complicated like a lot of it is, is strength conditioning issues like it's it's just it's basic strength and um, i think that's something that needs to be that needs to be looked at no matter what you're trying to guess right um a lot of it then can be technical. Yeah, you're right. First step, you could be taking, you know, you could be overreaching on your first step and taking that short first step and making it as powerful as you can be. Um, a lot of it is just not being exposed to speed. So, like, even in the Premier League, there's, you know, there's, 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 there's uh, studies and research on soft tissue injuries, hamstring pulls, which are common. Like, you know, every it's the bane of every GA club and 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 county, I suppose, to prevent hamstring issues is, is just that they haven't been exposed to, 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 to high velocity running so that when they get into a match situation they're, they're, they're asked to go above kind of what they've been trained to do and that's when you know you get, you get hamstring issues so it's not always the fact that they, they could be in the gym doing Nordics and Romanian deadlifts to beat the band and they could be strong but they're not they're not they're not strong at a certain velocity so it, it's more about just being able to expose them in a safe manner to 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 uh to kind of speed that they're you know not used to so that when they come to match day that, that they don't have those issues so look you don't want to make them you're not trying to turn a ga club player into you say him both either but there's there's just again low-hanging fruit there's easy you know there's small there's there's, there's small games straight off the bat you know like whether it's it's a defender wanting to get out ahead of their their man or a forward trying to beat their their marker like kind of speed is so crucial and it just seems like like you were saying there, like the GA isn't kind of realizing that kind of potential enough of the players. So it'll be very interesting over the coming years to see how much more speed becomes apart, how much more teams will um, look to athletics to try and improve their players. Because it seems like there is room for improvement there and everyone's looking for that marginal gain, that extra one or two percent. So it's, it's going to be interesting the next couple of years, Shane. Yeah, yeah, 100 percent. Like, you know, you can see, you can, you can see, you know, like I said, a reference Dublin there and you know, I, I can't speak to other counties, but you, you 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 can see the teams that are you know fundamentally at, at you know the, the, the root of it is that they're, they're an athletic base mm-hmm. uh, set up, and you know that that stuff is is, is priceless. You know, so no, great yeah. stuff, brilliant job, Shane. Come here, thanks for thanks for joining us, and best of luck in the season ahead with Phil. Fingers crossed that everything works out for her. No worries. Thanks very much, Karen. Thanks for listening to the Star Sport Podcast, the only podcast dedicated to all things sport in West Cork. Don't forget to pick up this Thursday Southern Star newspaper, including our award-winning sports section with everything a West Cork sports fan could want. In shops across West Cork and online from anywhere in the world via www.southernstar.ie forward slash e-paper. The Southern Star and the Star Sport Podcast. Number one for sport in West Cork. It's that time of year where clubs are dusting off the cobwebs and getting back into pre-season training and challenge games will be um, on the radar for a lot of clubs and that's why we're delighted to be joined by Marco Donovan, the creator of the Play Us GA app that can solve a lot of problems for clubs out there when it comes to arranging challenge games. First, Mark, tell us a small bit about this app, the Play Us GA app. Yeah, so Play Us, I suppose, Kieran, is an idea I came up with in 2016 to organise games for teams because it was becoming time-consuming. Mm. I suppose clubs have kind of one or two fellas inside them, or maybe three fellas, that they know a lot of other fellas in other clubs, and they're getting phone calls to, can your under-16s play, can your seniors play, this kind of thing. It was very time-consuming, and I started looking around for a technology, some kind of an app that would help to do this, and there was nothing there. Mm. So I got on to Crow Park, and... Lo and behold, they invited me up to sit down and talk about it and came on board and were very supportive, in fairness, since since we started looking at it. Um, it almost kind of mushroomed out of nothing, really, but they've been very good. So it's just an easy way for us to organise challenge games, tournaments or blitzes for any age group. Because like you know yourself being involved with Bantry Blues over the years and even being involved in the Kirby board yourself, Mark, that it can be hard to organise challenge games, you know, kind of. Um, even there, just I was talking to one of the St. James's footballers a couple of weeks ago and before one game they told me the manager rang nearly 17 clubs mm-hmm. before he actually got a game and he ended up getting a game against against Bale from North Kerry um, so hopefully an app like this can take a lot of that hard work out and make it a, a lot more simplistic for, for clubs yeah definitely um, I suppose we talk about player retention we talk about fellas enjoying the game we talk about coaching through games like games are the key to keeping players playing Like mm-hmm. their fellas will keep playing for years they'll enjoy their careers a bit more 
if they're playing more games. And we tend to, when we play a challenge game or a tournament or something like that, we tend to be a bit more relaxed. It's good for mentors as well to develop themselves working in a team, in adult teams and groups, in, t- in clubs, you know, trying to get that partnership going between three or four selectors and, you know, playing a lot of games together. Fellas work well together. Players work better together. So a non-competitive game is much better for development. And like I'm talking to clubs in Dublin, there are certain age groups where like they have huge population mm-hmm. and they're bringing in 20, 30 games a year outside of their fixture calendar. Like people are wondering why Dublin are progressing so much. They're just playing so much football. Like. And that's where this app comes in, the Play Us G app. Tell us how it works so, Mark. Kind of how does a club, kind of, I suppose, first get the app and how does it work from there? Yeah, okay. So I suppose version one of Play Us went straight to coaches, Kieran, mm-hmm. And a coach just simply went into his app store, downloaded Play Us and said he had a, an under 12 hurling team or a senior football team and that was his app to work with for the year then and uh, what we found was it was very difficult to spread it throughout the country going from coach to coach so version two actually goes directly to the clubs so a club secretary is preferable um, but it can be anyone in the club just go on to playusga.com and fill out an inquiry form and we send a verification link then to that email address and it leads you through the process it takes about maybe a minute to add a team in you can add in an unlimited amount of teams you could have, you have clubs that are playing four codes camogie and ladies football mixed in they can all be given access you could have 40 50 teams in some of the bigger clubs for 10 euros a year that's the access they get and they can organize as many games as they want the um, beauty of the secretary being the primary user mm-hmm. they'll get an email every time there's a game sanctioned between two coaches they'll get a verification email to pass on to their boards then as well so that cuts the admin out of it for the club secretaries and the coaches as well. And when they're using the app then, let's say it's it's a club from here in West Cork, can they pick, a, they can they choose from another Cork club or they can, can they go outside the county? How does that work then? Yeah, so there's another function change from version two. In version one, your location was the your pitch, your home pitch, mm-hmm. whereas with version two, so if you want to get, get a game within 30 kilometres, you set the range of 30 kilometres from your home pitch. Now, if you want to go up to Dublin and play a game before an All-Ireland quarterfinal or something like that, or go to Turles before the Munster final, or go to wherever you're going, you can actually change your location. Mm. So you could plan now a game in Dublin in the August weekend, you know? Yeah. And it's just a fantastic way. Like, you don't have to have any contacts. Look, and we don't want to take away that thing between coaches where fellas have contacts, Mm. and they like to play the same teams every now and again. And, you know, we know such and such, and two clubs might have a good rapport with each other. And we, that's that's that should stay, and that's mm-hmm. a great thing about the GA. Mm-hmm. But this gives it opens your horizons. Like otherwise, you end up kind of in a situation where you're playing the same clubs all the time. And I think look, it's kind of look variety. It's like yeah. everything in life. Players want variety mm-hmm. as well, and they do get a bit tired of playing the same club. So being able to change that location and get the game wherever you want, I think, is a is a really good step forward. And that was something Crow Park wanted with Abbottstown being built and stuff at the time Mm -hmm. they were saying like they want counties to come up play games in the morning the Dublin clubs are hungry for new clubs coming in as well Mm -hmm. so that's a really good function in version 2 No, it's a brilliant app Mark a brilliant app Mark and you really spotted the gap in the market and like even locally in West Cork and even even Cork and even further afield there's been fierce interest even some of the clubs Mm -hmm. who've come on board yeah so like it's it's sporadic Um, yesterday I had two clubs in Cavan and a club in Fermanagh um and then I had a couple of clubs below around home joining up as well. So like Ballingary, um, Bantry are obviously on it in fairness. The club have always been very supportive. Um, Winter Vahr, I came on board. I got a phone call before I came in here. Glyn Gareth and Caha Ogre both coming on. Um, you're up around Ballincollig, Aerog, Bride Rovers, Ahada. Mm-hmm. So it is, it's spreading. Um, it's just about keeping the momentum going really, Kieran, mm-hmm. to be honest. you know. And the beauty of it too, Mark, like we're sitting there, it's very easy to use. You know, kind of, you just have the app in your phone yeah. open it up and, and go from there yeah so once the admin or the primary user I'm not too sure I suppose we're kind of this terminology is developing as we're going like yeah. it's a new thing so it's difficult to know what doesn't scare people we don't want people to think there's a lot of administration in it mm-hmm. like I was saying there a second ago it takes about a minute to set up a team once you have the team set up the coach gets the verification email then themselves okay they go in they download it and all they do is create game you pick a challenge game at or a tournament the date the time whether you want to change your location or stay where it is and then set the radius 30 kilometers 40 kilometers 50 whatever um 
takes, I'd say. No, I'm sick of using it. Not sick of using it, but I'm so used <laughs> to using so you, it. Yeah, yeah. You can set up you set up a challenge game in a minute, like, and then you're waiting for responses to come in. So, like, it's very exciting to think that we'll say if you had a good portion of clubs mm-hmm. coming on board, and they are coming on board, that you could be sitting at home on a Monday evening and you'll be getting invitations to play challenge games, mm-hmm. or that say if you're with a senior team at home and senior teams or junior teams like they're all looking for games you could set up two tournaments now tonight and have them for june and august and clubs that invitation will be out there then for clubs to come and tournaments are something very difficult to like sam mcguire the tournament the man we had there last year yeah like it's a brilliant event right it's a huge amount of work and and like we should be able to have you know a smaller tournament played in the weekend there inside in the club four six teams coming in barbecue going you know that's what the ga was about like and it's very like it's it's exciting to think that you could organize things that easily just through play us you know it is you know like i said it's, it's a great idea and like i mentioned earlier with challenge games at the moment like teams are getting ready for like the keller shield and the division yeah. the county leagues are kicking off this weekend the county championships are going to be huge this year mm. being being revamped teams will be wanting to kind of be prepared for those so that's why this app is just perfect because clubs will want to get challenge games in and this can help take some of the kind of the stress out of that whole kind of arranging. Yeah, it, it will. And I suppose the under eights down to the under tens, the blitzes, all this kind of stuff. Like there's a lot of work goes into it. Um, clubs, like I was saying a while ago, they want games like and mentors need games mm-hmm. together in order to develop as well as a, as a, um, as a management team. Um yeah, like it's play us will take the work out of it, but it does need a lot of clubs to come on board before yeah. it makes it very, mm-hmm. very easy for teams to get. But I don't see an issue. I'm getting very, very positive feedback. Um, the fact that it's priced at only 10 euros a year for a club. Some clubs have asked me, could you not make it free for a year? And to be honest, I'd give it away for nothing. Like, this isn't my job. I'm a contracts manager in the building industry. It's not. Like, this isn't what... I just want to be able to use the app to get games for my own teams that I'm involved in, to be honest with you. But it's been a huge learning curve yeah. for me. Um, if I gave it out for nothing, I think I, I genuinely feel, and the GA above and Crow Park felt as well, if you don't put a price in it, people will think it's useless. So yeah. the, the €10 Euros just to cover... And in, in the grand scheme of t- things, €10 Euros nothing, you oh, know, kind of spread out over, no. over, over 350, six days of the year, no. like this year. And as well, like you mentioned there about the teams, like... What age grade does this cover? Like, this isn't just senior adult team. Mm. It goes right the way down. And even men's and women's? Men's, women's, yeah. It's covering all four GA codes and all age groups, yeah. So clubs should get mm. very, very good value for it. Yeah. Like, like even if you have... Like, Glengar have signed up a while ago, right? They've only... Jun- they've, they, their junior football team is the only team that's going to be going on it, right? Mm-hmm. But, like, if that junior football team only gets two or three challenge games extra out of it, should have 10 euros well spent, like. Exactly. You know? And even they might, hopefully, organise a tournament for themselves and things like that, so... Like, it's endless, like, the Glengarriff Juniors will get as much value out of it as the um, Kilmacode Seniors, mm-hmm. you know? So, yeah. it's I think it's it's very good value, like, you know. And just to remind people again where they can go to kind of download the app. Yeah, so you go onto the website, playusga.com, mm-hmm. and there's an inquiry form there. Now there's little videos up there and tutorials and stuff as well, but as we're going, I'll be a very, very good team around me of all voluntary people again. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> God bless the GA. Um, <laughs> That's no, the beauty of it, isn't it? Yeah, and my family at home are very good. Um, Graham and Rory obviously are a big help coming along. I have a good friend of mine there, Magella McCarthy, helping. So um, we're, we're constantly tweaking the way we're doing things as we're going because we're getting feedback. So we're trying to evolve the way we're... The registration has to stay the way it is. We're trying to evolve how we present it to people and what makes it easier for them. So... I'm actually going around to visit clubs here and myself. I was going Ballingary now Friday night to the lads and I'd say it, I think it took about 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, 20 minutes talking to the lads. I'd say it took about three minutes to set it up. Yeah. Um, bought a few lot of tickets and a good crack at the lads about coaching and they couldn't believe how easy it was to set it up mm-hmm. and like they put on five teams straight away and they're going to keep adding to that. And like if clubs like Ballingary or any club if they put seven, eight, ten coaches on it mm-hmm. then it's going to mushroom very, very quickly, like, you know. And if clubs want to get in contact with you, Mark, to kind of learn a bit more about this and maybe want you to kind of call out like you did Bellingham yeah. earlier, just to, yeah. just, just to visit the club and explain it, like, what's the best way to get in contact with you? Yeah, I'd say the inquiry form on the website is probably the best. Um, 
or through the Facebook page. We have a Facebook page. You could message on that as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, my phone numbers on, I'd say, it's on the Blues Facebook or the Blues um, website. It's probably still on the Carberry Board website. I'm very open to it, to be honest, Karen. Yeah. Um, like I say, it is. It's it's a hobby, but I enjoy going out meeting other J people. So, I'm if I'm available to call out to a club, I'm most very very willing to do so. Oh, brilliant, Mark. Thank you so much for joining us. Like we said, an absolutely brilliant idea, and the very best to look at it. Thanks very much, Karen. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to the Star Sport Podcast, the only podcast dedicated to all things sport in West Cork. Don't forget to pick up this Thursday Southern Star newspaper, including our award-winning sports section with everything a West Cork sports fan could want. In shops across West Cork and online from anywhere in the world via www.southernstar.ie forward slash e-paper. The Southern Star and the Star Sport Podcast. Number one for sport in West Cork. Welcome back to the Star Sport Podcast. And as always, at this time of the week, just before we wrap up the show, Kieran gives us a preview of what we can expect in this week's Southern Star Sports section. So, Kieran, take it away. It's another action packed 24 page sports section winging its way to West Cork sports fans this Thursday morning. Like we mentioned earlier, the Cork Offaly and Cork Westmead match reports and reaction are all in there. We didn't touch on the Cork Hurdlers' defeat to Waterford in the open round of the Division 1 Hurling League, but that's in this week's sports section. Kieran Kingston's reaction to that defeat and also looking forward to the Tipperary game at Parky Cueve this Saturday night. The Cork and Tip Hurling game actually serves as a doubleheader with the Cork and Waterford Camogie League opener at Park and Cueve on Saturday and I caught up with Linda Collins of Coursey Rovers to get her thoughts on Cork Camogie and the season at head, head. Um, plenty going on this week I, there's a three pages of rowing in this week's Southern Star and um, there's a two page special we're actually looking very closely at the battle for the two seats in the Irish lightweight men's double so I've talked to some of the people involved I've talked to the Rowing Ireland High Performance Director just to kind of plot out what's going to happen over the next couple of weeks Um the competition for places there's big trials coming up at the end of february and a big one at the end of march and after that we learn what two skibbereen men will be in the irish lightweight double that will go forward into the international season we've also coverage from the irish indoor um, national rowing championships that were on at ul last weekend huge west cork interest in that there was 50 or 60 west cork rowers there and one of the big takeaways was paul o'donovan who's obviously in he's leading the race to win a seat in that Irish lightweight double he won his lightweight men's category and he set a new national record beating the record that he set last year and Fintan McCarthy finished second with a personal best Shane O'Driscoll finished third in a personal best um, and Jake McCarthy was fourth Gary O'Donovan missed out because he was ill but it just goes to show that the five men who are in the running for, for that Irish lightweight double they're in top form at the moment so that that battle for the seats is very very interesting we've also a quick look at um Bendon um Bendon soccer club have a huge game against Cork City well it's a glamour tie this this uh Sunday um as they celebrate their fifth sorry this Saturday sorry Saturday February 1st as they celebrate their 50th anniversary so we've all that news the Muscogee GA Awards run last weekend Daniel Goulding got the big prize there so we've all that and a lot lot more plus previews of the Carberry Under-21 Football Championships, which throw in this weekend. As you can see, Jack, there's a hell of a lot going on in this week's sports section, so well worth the, the couple of euro on Thursday morning. Yeah, available in shops across West Cork and further afield from Thursday morning and online from southernstar.ie forward slash e-paper. Brilliant. So thanks for listening to this week's Star Sport Podcast. We'll be back at the same time next week. So if you enjoy these shows, please make sure to rate, review and subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Acast, Stitcher or wherever else you listen to the show.